so we're going to do something a little different. I'm going to read this article that, that a couple people have been posting. I read through some of it. I haven't read through all of it. Um, so there is a uh, disclosure uh, about that. Um, I haven't read through all of it, but we're going to read it together. So I hope you guys are, are, are cool with that. So we'll, we'll read through it. I'll do a couple responses. It's somewhat lengthy. And I'll do my best uh, at reading. I'm not here. This is another disclaimer at the top, too. Uh, I'm not the best reader in the world. Um, I always used to get embarrassed when I was in uh, in middle school about reading. Um, I, I would I would always that, that's sort of my uh, Achilles heel, if you will, is reading out loud. So I'm, I'm being very vulnerable by doing this, you guys. Uh, it's a super vulnerable moment for your for your boy Krish Mohan. So uh, let's see. Let's make sure I'm doing this right. There we go. Okay. So this is on Quora. It's an article titled, can you guys see this? Uh, yeah. Okay. It's showing up. Um, what liberals don't realize. That's the title of the article. What most, what most liberals, what don't most liberals realize? See, I told you I'm fucking it up already. <laughs> what don't most liberals realize? Uh, it's by this guy named Peter Kruger. Um, he's at the Mitchell Hamlin School of Law, and uh, this is a this is from a couple about a month ago. He wrote this, right? Um, Cora is, I guess, like a website where you can kind of sign sign in and, and write these essays like this. Um, sometimes they're on point, other times they're not. Uh, but I like them. I think they're cool. Uh, I found some value in um in them so let's begin reading so uh he starts the article i'm in a bit of a unique position to answer this i suppose as i also note in my companion answer to the corresponding conservative question i'm a never trumper and i believe in careful measured restrained deliberate progress my more liberal friends are convinced i'm a conservative but most conservative seem convinced i'm somewhere left of karl marx here's the thing. The Overton window of this country has moved way far over to the right. Like even the Democrats are legislating for like more right-wing ideas than they are left-wing ideas. Right. Like you really have to twist their arm. Like even Nancy Pelosi is like, like there was a story that came out saying that Nancy Pelosi was going to um, look into universal basic income. And she said, I never said that. I don't want to say that. I said, maybe some kind of a paycheck protection, something um, and she, and you know, like they're still not advocating for this universal basic income because it will fundamentally shift what it means to be a Democrat in this country. Anyway, let's keep reading. Uh, I grew up a short distance away from the birthplace of the Republican party, which was a liberal and highly progressive party when it was created. I might point out, I had immediate family in the Grange, uh, a progressive Republican organization of farmers for most of its history. I was probably in college before I, I met a Democrat, right? And he's right. Uh, Lincoln was the first Republican president, very progressive uh, president by, uh, by, by all means of it. Uh, so we'll keep reading. By the time I was old enough to be aware of pol politics, most people around me listened to WTMJ, not sure what that is, uh, Charlie Sykes, I, I do know that name, and Republicanism had turned uh, conservative and reactionary. The Tea Party was highly active and successful in my hometown and school district. My county broke 60-30 for Trump. How did an era of La Follette progressive farmers barely 100 years ago become what it is today? I've talked about this idea too. Um, if you remember, uh, I don't know if, you, if, if anybody checked it out or not, but I, I talked about Blair Mountain um, in West Virginia being this hotbed for these progressive socialist worker based ideas, right? This, this battle for, for, um, unions and the working class. And that was in 1921. And then we move forward to almost a hundred years from now, even in less than a hundred years for the last like 30 years, West Virginia has seen these like cousin fucking hicks, these toothless assholes, right? And how did that happen? How did we go from the bastion of fighting for worker rights against the against corporatism against this like this 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 corporate slavery to calling these people hicks 
and uneducated and stuff like that. So he goes on, he's, he's gonna, he talks about these farmers, these progressive farmers, right? Uh, progressivism started failing them, them specifically. And this enlarge what I think liberals have tended to fail to consider. I understand that I'm likely to be a bit stereotypical here in lumping liberals in with city people. The, there are liberals in rural areas, sure. Most of them have a, already realized a lot of what I'm writing. And this is where I tour. So I, I've kind of seen this. I, a lot of people give me shit for the places that I tour, right? I tour a lot down south. I tour a lot in the Midwest. Um, and these are these tend to be more rural areas. And those are the areas where people come out and they might be considered conservative or they might be considered libertarian or what have you but they enjoy what I'm saying. They believe in what I'm saying. They agree with me for the most part. And whatever disagreements we have, we're able to sit down and over a beer and talk about it. Whereas in places like Asheville, North Carolina, or Portland, Oregon, or even San Francisco, which have become these faux progressive neoliberal cities, uh, where, you know, as long as they say nice things and say, we support gay people, but then fund the, 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 anti-gay kind of candidate because they look good and whatever, right? These neoliberal, like let's profit belief systems kind of thing. Whenever I go to those cities, I get, I take a lot of shit for what I'm saying, for, for standing with the working class, for saying that we shouldn't uh, support the oligarchy. We shouldn't support Joe Biden. <laughs> um, so, uh, where are we at? Okay. For the most part, most outspoken liberals are not rural folks. The ones that dominate the Democratic Party are typically from urban areas. This is, as I have looked into the history of things, an artifact of the 20th century. There were formerly progressive wings in both major parties, but into the 20th century, the Republican Party tended to move more and more rural rather than just north. Republicans had always tended to be more pro-capital through the late 19th century, while labor was more a Democratic plank. The, there was a pro-labor progressive movement for a brief time that really held sway over the Republican Party leaders with uh, Republican Party with leaders such as Theodore Roosevelt, Henry Cabot Lodge, Robert Feitenbaum La Follet, and William Howard Taft. All of that is almost true. Uh, Teddy Roosevelt, I will say, did try to pull away from the profitization of the Republican Party itself because he went up against Taft and Taft went straight to the delegates because he was like, none of these fucking mooks are fucking making the decisions. The delegates are picking the candidate for the party. So I'm going to circumvent all of this nonsense and go directly to the delegates. Teddy Roosevelt saw that was happening, felt that it was bullshit and created the Bull Moose Party. I've talked about the Bull Moose Party. I'm writing about the Bull Moose Party. Um, and that was a progressive wing. It was an anti-corporate populist party uh, in the early 1900s. So this is almost accurate. Taft wasn't really um, part of that progressive wing. Teddy Roosevelt lost. He got 20% of the votes, but he lost. Um, and, uh, and then the Bull Moose Party kind of dissolved, and most of them went back to being Republicans anyway. So maybe that's where he's assessing that information from. I don't know. Uh, rural organizations like the Grange, were the most progressive pro-labor force in agricultural regions like the Midwest, kind of like the, um, the coal workers union was in uh, West Virginia. As the Republican Party lost its progressive wing in the early 20th, early 20th century into intra-party fighting between the more measured Roosevelt progressives and the more radical La Follette Republicans, the conservative pro-capital wing regained control of the party with leadership such as Warren Harding and Herbert Hoover. Uh, I have to look into La Follette. Maybe that'll be something that I talk about later this week. Um, now, Woodrow Wilson solidified a pro-labor progressive contingent within the Democratic Party when the Republican coalition fell apart in 1912. Uh, uh, bullshit, actually. That is super false. Uh, Woodrow Wilson was a neoliberal capitalist, <laughs> a pro-war neoliberal capitalist. Woodrow Wilson is the reason why we have the Espionage Act. Woodrow Wilson is the reason why we don't trust whistleblowers. Woodrow Wilson is the reason why Julian Assange is still in fucking prison 
for revealing the truth about American war crimes and corporate fraud on a global scale. Woodrow Wilson went up against a, a true pro-worker, pro-labor candidate named Eugene V. Debs, who ran in the Socialist Party of America. Woodrow Wilson was not a fucking progressive. Woodrow Wilson is what the mainstream Democratic Party actually fucking is. So I got to disagree uh, with with the with the author here, with Peter here, uh, because that is uh, super wrong. Okay, this was primarily aimed at unionization, which in turn uh, tended to be more heavily favored uh, in the increased industrialization and urbanization of the country. By the time that Franklin Delano, Delano Roosevelt was elected to office, Republicans were increasingly becoming the party of the rural areas and the Northeast, and the Democrats were increasingly becoming the party of the cities. That might be true. I'm 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 not super familiar with the with with the history of kind of that split that happened. Um, it might have happened during FDR. It might have happened a little after FDR. Um, so uh, I, I'm not particularly sure. But I do think that the Democratic Party was not about unionization um, until FDR came into power. Uh, Wilson actively fought against any sort of unionization. He called it Bolshevism. He used McCarthyist tactics before they were McCarthyist. We should really call it Wilsonist uh if uh if 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 we're being totally accurate about it uh woodrow wilson put out the, i mean the espionage act is kind of the lead-in to mccarthyist principles okay uh that split was torn open by the passage of the civil rights act of 1964 and other progressive reforms of the late 1960s the conservative dixiecrats of the rural south finally abandoned party loyalty for ideological loyalty and switch sides when conservative leadership within the Republican Party worked out a deal to provide them with continued seniority, starting with Strom Thurmond. Joe Biden's really good friend. <laughs> Joe Biden worked with Strom Thurmond <laughs> and, and supported like segregation. <laughs> so um, this urban-rural divide, he was a Dixiecrat. This urban-rural divide had continued to accelerate to today, evident in this electoral map, uh, such as these from the 2016 election. I don't know how many of you guys can see this. Um, you, you, you might be able to see it a little bit more clearly on your screen. I'm not entirely sure. Uh, but uh, that's a lot of red, folks. Uh, and this is, it's a, lot of, uh, it's a lot of where I tour, to be honest. Right, like the middle of this country, uh, I was I, I went deep south. Uh, I went from Alabama uh, into te into the the Arkansas area, into Tennessee, into Texas, Louisiana, and up into the Midwest around Chicago, and then came home. That was my last tour. That whole big swath of fucking red. That's where I tour. That's that's my bread and butter, you guys fucking red states in 2016 i was in these areas by the way most of them uh this is adjusted for population and this is a, an election map i'm not really sure exactly what this map is and this map seems very weird uh it's a 3d map i guess it's showing you where where there's a democratic and republican presence uh, I don't bring this up to get into a debate about the electoral call college, only to point out urban rural divide. Okay, that's fine. Uh, so one, the, it's an ideology. Uh, uh, it's not an ideology or even a partisanship. It's about rural consciousness. Okay, if you haven't read Kathleen Kramer's outstanding work in uh, the politics of resentment, I haven't. I, you really, really should. I probably will. Uh, <laughs> as I read it, I was stunned at how well she described my hometown and the people in it. Uh, I don't know if one of the test groups she had was actually in my town, but it might as well have been. It was eerily familiar. You know, I remember reading an article in uh, in in 2016 before the election about how uh, the more rural areas of uh, and this might be she might be the author of it because I can't remember the author of it. But it basically talked about how these like rural farmers in uh, like northern Wisconsin were kind of resentful of Madison and Milwaukee, Wisconsin, because all the rules were made in regards to what farmers in that little area wanted. Um, and she said, like, 
these guys basically said that they don't feel represented and they don't feel heard, um, which is why they're, they were more likely to vote for Trump because they feel like Trump, um, you know, uh, listened to them. So maybe that's kind of the same thing. I, I'm, I'm going to have to check that out and revisit it if that is the same thing. Because I remember reading it going, yeah, this fucking explains a whole lot of shit. It explains all of the things I'm hearing while I'm on tour. Okay, Kramer discovered that rural people very much have their own social identity, and they feel that it's, it is it is both under attack and worthy of preservation, and that it is not justified. The politics are dominated by the increasingly concentrated population of urban areas. Without geographical representation, like the Electoral College, or what liberals point out is an unfair weight uh, of the rural vote, there is a fear one that is often realized that city folk will simply come in, invade them, and impose their city-minded views on them. Which is so interesting because this sounds like rural gentrification, doesn't it? It kind of sounds like rural gentrification. <laughs> it's what poor people get scared whenever, like the you know, like the like the the richy rich move into the area. You know, like those yuppies move in because uh, they got a job at the tech company and they're making like 125k starting and they're like we just brought this home and we're going to renovate it and do all these things to it and everybody else in the neighborhood that's like oh god are you going to increase the property value and fuck me out of my house like it kind of sounds like that <laughs> when you hear rural people wanting deregulation and complain about overreach they're just latching on to terms that describe what they experience I can't tell you how many farmers or rural county executives I know that are pissed to hell at the state because it seems like every year there is some new un unfunded mandate or regulation or tax law. There may be and usually a very good reasons for these things, but they aren't explained to my people. It's just another uh, edict from Madison and Milwaukee. I, so it sounds like it is the thing that I read. Um, they have a lower tax basis and lower economies of scale because of the lack of population density. Progressive policies often fail to take into account uh, and raise revenue by raising statewide property taxes. This massively disproportionate hits massively di disproportionately hits rural people who tend to be land rich and money poor. Land is a great asset, but it is not a liquid one. So when we're barely breaking even most years, and two shitty seasons away from complete insolvency and China and California and giant agricorps are dumping cheap milk and pork into the system, uh, we're kind of fucked when you start demanding another thousand bucks a year from us. That's a fair concern. That's a fair concern. Um, you know, and, and because they because they are land rich, if you increase property taxes on them without, saying why you're increasing property taxes on them. I mean, you could do the same thing for companies like Monsanto, for, for Chinese-based companies, right? Um, and that's what a lot of other companies do is they buy up property. In fact, that's kind of the thing that we're seeing now is based on how things are going, based on the debt market that's being created uh, because of back rent, back mortgages, and things like that, um, we're going to see property getting seized up by wealthy people, by other countries. The parking meters in Chicago are owned by Dubai. They just bought up the property where the parking meters are. So, like, you're not helping the city of Chicago when you pay a parking meter. You're helping Dubai. This is, like, very typical of what happens. Companies come in, they buy land, and then those companies get nationalized in a different country, and then now that country owns a piece of land in America because it's a corporate loophole because the public sector and the private sector are interconnected and owned by the same shit. It's a very, like, serious fucking thing. <laughs> Okay, so Minnesota is trying something that might help in the form of a tax credit for agricultural land when school districts want to pass a referendum so that farmers that are disproportionately impacted by property tax hikes don't get hit as hard. This is a good idea and a way to help show that progressive policies don't have to end up breaking them. Cool. This should 
be looked into and tried to be applied. This is something I, I'll, I'll probably look into and try to understand it. Uh, <laughs> number two, liberals can be pretentious as fuck sometimes. Yes, uh, he, he has a, 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 a little dialogue from, uh, from Firefly. Great show. Um, big fan of that show. Uh, it is my people consider liberals to be smug elitists that look down on them. And both sides are not unjustified. Look at what you see uh, TV represent representing my people. The positive end of the stick is that uh, the naivete of Parks and Rec. Uh, what do we more commonly see ourselves portrayed as? Called on national television. Rednecks, inbred hicks, toothless hillbillies, racists and homophobes clinging to their guns and Bibles. Yeah, I know if you take Obama's entire quote in context, it's speaking precisely to this problem, but the soundbite was all my people hurt. And... I mentioned this a few minutes ago is, yeah, this is exactly what I'm kind of baffled by because when I go down South, when I go into the Midwest, when I go into these rural areas, I meet more progressive people, people that you wouldn't think are traditionally progressive. Stuart Huff and I were in Kalamazoo a few years ago, and I know I've told this story uh, probably at some point in this, in, in, in some video, but we saw a guy at our show wearing a shirt that says, you can pry my gun from my cold dead hands. And we were like, well, this guy's out. He's probably going to say some shit in the middle of the show. He fucking loved us. He loved it. And he came up and talked to Stuart, bought five of his CDs and two of mine uh, because he ran out of cash. And then, uh, and then he basically said, I live in the country. I live 40 minutes outside of Kalamazoo, and I need my guns to protect myself from like animals that come on my property. And I also have like a quarter mile driveway. So people don't show up unless I invite them or I know they're coming over. So yeah, I got to be a little bit protective, but I don't think everybody should just own them willy nilly. You should have a reason for owning them and you should know what you're doing with like, he was pretty reasonably minded and we made a, we made a judgment call and we were the assholes in that situation. Uh, look, this, is, this isn't entirely your fault. Liberals. I grew up with the uh, Jew jokes and black jokes and rampant homophobia uh, a family member who was a coach once yelled to one of his kids, run like a Mexican with a TV on his shoulder. I'm not kidding. It's that bad. Fuck, that's crazy. <laughs> oh my God. That's so wild. You know what's funny? Um, I've heard crazy, you know, stereotypical racist jokes like that from both sides. I literally had a Democrat come up to me. Um, she walked up and she said, it's so great that you're doing your show. The show was called How Not to Fit In. It's one of like the earliest albums I put out back in 2016 or something. And uh, the whole show is about like how I don't fit into both American culture and, um, you know, Indian culture, right? I don't fit into either of them. And I talk about that. And, sh and she was like, I'm so excited. You know, you don't see a lot of Indian comics, blah, blah, blah super excited about it. I thought she was going to love the show. And she came up to me after the show and she goes, you know, it would have been really nice if you, uh, if you did the accent a little bit, if you spoke with the accent, it would be really nice. Uh, I think that would be really, uh, it would enhance the act. Also, you know, what happened to all the stereotypes? Like she literally said, what happened to all the stereotypes? How come I didn't hear any jokes about Seven Eleven? How come I didn't hear any jokes about, and I've had this conversation with conservative club owners that have told me I need Seven Eleven jokes with liberal club owners that said I need 7-Eleven jokes. <laughs> like this sort of shit happens all the time. All right. Uh, I don't want to make any excuses for that, but here's why context matters. We didn't have any of those people in our community with the exception of homosexual people, though we certainly didn't know any of those. Homosexuality was one of those things that was pointedly ignored. I had a great aunt and uncle who, uh, lived with a friend all my life. <laughs> my family still won't acknowledge the truth of it. Uh, yeah, you know what show kind of really did a great job of addressing that was New Girl. Schmidt wouldn't accept that his mom was a lesbian for like a good like three seasons. And they kind of very subtly uh, addressed it and, and like pulled Schmidt out of it. Like it was, it was really well done. Uh, but yeah, they're right. Uh, I was... I was the minority kid in my school for a while.
Like there weren't, weren't a lot of black kids in my school. There weren't a lot of Mexican kids. Like I was diversity in my school for a little while. Um, that changed. Fortunately, uh, that changed. So, uh, yeah, I, uh, I completely understand that. And that's part of the reason why, you know, when you look at media and there isn't proper representation and isn't just a stereotypical representation, like people look at the media and they think that I'm that fucking Indian kid from the Big Bang Theory where they're just like, oh, you probably are scared of girls and can't talk to them when they're around. It's amazing that you go up on stage with women in the audience and say words out loud into a microphone. And it's just like, great, okay, thanks, fucking CBS, right? Like, that's kind of what people think because they've never met an Indian person before or they never met a Mexican person. So they see these stereotypes. It's part of the reason why I stopped doing stereotype jokes in my act, or if I did them, I subverted them. I flip them. I satirize them. Um, it's why I don't straight up just fucking do stereotypes. Uh, and I lost my place. Sorry. Hold on. Okay. <laughs> I've tried to explain it to my people. Uh, most of them won't listen. You can look at the comments I receive from certain people when I've written about white privilege as exhibit A. I, I get basically the same trying uh, to explain... Explain it to people back home. When I used to try to explain it to them, I was considering one of them smug, pretentious elitists who got a degree and thinks I'm better than them now. It took time for me to learn how to have those conversations in a way that helped me realize uh, the real harm those things cause. Yeah, and that's super difficult because I have dated a lot of uh, a lot of girls. Like my ex-wife's family was pretty conservative, um, and I'm basically like a hippie, lefty socialist. Right. Um, you know, where I'm like, fucking work a revolution. Let's do this shit. And they're like, we need our Bibles. Uh, and I would sit down and the first thing I would do is listen to them. Tell me what's up. And then we would talk about it. And I would go, you know, uh, I hear what you're saying and I can totally see where that's coming from. Have you thought about this? Here's a piece of information that perhaps you haven't heard. And that's a lot of what I got is, boy, I never thought about it that way. Oh, I hadn't heard that before. Um, but that's because I sat down and just listened to them. And it took me fucking years to figure that shit out. Yeah, like I went through my early 20s just snapping at people like that and getting nothing out of it. it took me years. It's super difficult. It's very hard. And you need like, I don't know, a million pounds of patience to get through that. And if you don't do it consistently, they tend to kind of slip back to, uh, you know, to, to, to their homeostasis of, you know, run like a Mexican holding a TV or whatever the fuck that quote was. Um, they go back to that because that's their, that's, that's the homeostasis. That's the origin point. And if you don't keep pulling them, you know, you're never going to shift that homeostasis over to a more uh, progressive side. It's the same thing goes with politics. If we don't push our politicians to take a more progressive stance, then that Overton window is never going to shift on a political level. Okay. Um, what most liberals tend to, fail, uh, tend to fail to realize is that it's a lack of experience with those groups of people. Liberals tend to make moral judgments about these people uh, because of these things. These people, in their view, we must believe uh, these things because they are terrible, immoral people. They believe uh, that these people must be irredeemable because who doesn't know uh, that such things are wrong today? I have a whole story about this on my album, Empathy on Sale, which is available for free uh, on my banking. Uh, it's the Uncle Marv story. If you've if you've seen me do stand up in the last couple of years, you've heard the Uncle Marv story. It's one of my favorite stories. It's a super important story. Uh, it's what got uh, somebody to threaten to decapitate me at one point. It's a, it's a good story, guys. Um, <laughs> um, that's not it. It's a real lack of realness to them. The only place that most of these minority communities exist to them is on television, which is never set where they are. It's set in cities far away from them. They don't see that their reality represented to them with any fairness. My family had to learn the hard way why black jokes aren't cool as my sister married a black man from Chicago. They just don't know. You understand, like, to my ex-wife's family, like, I was the first, like, immigrant Indian kid that they ever met. So I sat down and just had a conversation with them. 
and kind of had to be like, okay, you're going to make this weird fucking joke, but it's because you've just like never fucking really met an Indian. Like you, the only Indian person you know is a doctor. That's why you make doctor jokes all the time. <laughs> like that's, that's part of the thing, right? <laughs> Uh, it was suddenly real to them. An increasing Hispanic population in my home area, working a lot of the dairy jobs, has been creating an interesting split. The people who interact with them constantly, like the dairy farms that hire them, have done a 180 on Mexican jokes and anti-Hispanic rhetoric. People who don't interact with that community regularly are set in their old ways, and it's causing a lot of friction. Not just between the Hispanic community and the bigoted population, but between the two white communities. My people are welcoming to the people they actually know. When something happens, we all pitch into the fundraiser and grab their chain chainsaws to get a tree off of somebody's house after a bad storm. Doesn't matter who you are and what you look like or what your sexual orientation or non-binary gender is. This is the most dangerous thing to the oligarchs. Fred Hampton, who was, who was one of the most influential Black Panther leaders, was 23. Uh, he started out in the, in the Panther Party when he was about 20 and became a very prolific community organizer and leader in Chicago, was fucking murdered by the Chicago police and the FBI because he talked to white rural people. And he was bringing them into the coalition and starting a movement within... Black people and white people and Hispanic people and Chinese people and everybody was coming together. And that was scary because J. Edgar Hoover was a paranoid old white man that believed that the black messiah was coming to start a race war because him and Charlie Manson are basically the same fucking person. And then Fred Hampton, because he was starting a movement, was fucking murdered. This is the scariest thing to the deep state, to the intelligence community, to the corporate oligarchs, that all of the workers look beyond their identities, there's no longer that split, and they fucking attack you. That's what they do. That's how they fucking operate. This is the most dangerous fucking thing. Once you see outside this worldview, once you see outside this individualistic mindset of this ego-driven American exceptionalism bullshit and start cooperating with each other where it doesn't matter what your identity or sexuality is, where you're just people and you can get along and learn and understand and, and, and work together for common good causes, that's the scariest fucking thing. And you'll see them use your propaganda machines like the New York Times or MSNBC or CNN or Fox News. And they'll spin it so that people start dividing themselves up again. <sighs> Where do they? Okay. <laughs> Keep losing my place. I'm sorry. Okay, but this isn't reported. This isn't what makes it into the portrayals of my people on television. Nobody makes a national broadcast over aerial television uh, show out of rural Wisconsin that depicts the positives of rural life as it is. Even on cable, every show I've ever watched doesn't honor the rural consciousness. It treats it as a joke or an exaggeration. At worst, we are a land of serial killers, deplorables, and poor people. And if we weren't hanging, hanging on by a raggedy thread, maybe we could take it. Maybe. But we are. My people feel humiliated by you. And ultimately, humiliation is the root of all terrorism. And there are some uh, serious fences to mend here, and it's going to take a lot of effort to rebuild the measure of trust. That's, that's made a lot harder by something I'll discuss later. Okay, I do want to read some of your comments and see uh, where, uh, where we go from here. Uh, Jay Jackson's tuning in. Hi, Jay. History lessons with Chris. I know. Yeah, that's what these are. Uh, these are turning into Chris Tree. Oh man, that's a good hashtag, Jay. That's a good hashtag. <laughs> the ma I would. I actually. Yeah. I. I literally just had that thought right, as I stopped reading. Is the the maga dude uh, from our coffee shop show? Uh, so if you don't know, uh, Jay, very funny comedian, incredible singer, by the way, too. Um, he lives in in Little Rock, and we did a show at uh, Guillermo Coffee House last year. And before our show, there was this like, like everything against his current administration was a poetry show. <laughs> and it was this lesbian, Latino, non-binary poet. And she read some pretty heavy, like anti-Trump poems. And there was a dude in a MAGA hat that sat through fucking all of it, 
all of it. He sat through all of it. And then he sat through our show. Jay is a black gay uh, military person. <laughs> I'm a immigrant socialist comedian. And he sat through the entire show. And the worst thing that happened was I didn't get to talk to him after the show. Because he had been in the coffee shop for what I presume is four hours. But that dude fucking sat through something that he shouldn't have enjoyed. <laughs> Tabitha. Uh, this is us. I support Amendment 2, but the crazed dingbats with guns and state capitals displaying their white privilege. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, the, that guy just wanted us to be responsible with, with guns and not, uh, not take it away. Uh, John Sheehan. Uh, my mom used to call me every time the Big Bang Theory made a comic book reference and asked me if I was watching. And I was like, no, I'm not watching the nerd minstrel show. <laughs> yes, that show is also insulting to nerd culture. <laughs> uh, Jay, you made me think of something I have been wondering off and on for the past two weeks. How did it come to pass that these protests to reopen states under quarantine orders uh, get co-opted by Second Amendment fanatics and the alt-right movements. Yeah, I I've been uh, uh, thinking about that too, and I think I think it's just it's paranoia. It's it's the it's this kind of understanding that the government with progressive policies isn't out to make real progressive policies. They you know they're they're out to increase your tax on uh, on your on your land assets and come for your wealth and and so on and so forth. So then they kind of have to take these militia routes and grab their guns and go, you know, fight the government as, as the militia did back in, back in the old days. Um, and then, you know, the narrative gets co-opted where it's not, let's sit down and talk to these people and ask them the question of like, Hey, what are you afraid of? Why do you think we should reopen the States without any sort of, um, real plan in place? Right. Um, I've been saying this for weeks. I think herd immunity is probably the way forward, but herd immunity, just like social distancing and quarantine, without a medical treatment plan, uh, without a economic plan, is kind of doomed to fail. So whatever we do going forward has to have a plan that involves medical treatment and uh, an economic plan. And I think because there isn't one, uh, their fear is being twisted into reopen the states i don't know what to do and i'm scared uh, so i get it i don't agree with it but i understand where it's coming from and it sucks because that's i think that's a real fear that we all have is like what the fuck is happening um and what are we going to do like how are we going to move forward from this so yeah and i think because they carry guns they they get looped into all of them get looped into the anti-vaxxers or the the second amendment people or the alt-right people who also kind of have this like go against the government mentality <laughs> john sheehan fantastic musician by the way uh does live streams every monday that you should check out uh have you ever heard about the rural purge on cbs they canceled green acres uh and other rural shows in the late 60s because of bad ratings but because they didn't want their brand to be associated with country folk. Uh, Green Acres is an amazing show. Check it out if you haven't seen it. I have not seen it. Um, early 70s. I will have to check that out. I'll have to add that to my list. I am working my way through Star Trek right now. Uh, and once I finish that, uh, and once uh, Captain Jean-Luc Picard accepts my dad ship, uh, when he becomes my dad, I'm doing fine in the quarantine, you guys. Uh, I, I, I will have to check out some Green Acres. I've heard about this show, actually. Um, you know what's a really uh, another great show uh, that uh, John and, and you guys should check out? It's on Netflix. It's a show called The Ranch. Uh, the first season has a bunch of, like, goofy kind of sitcom -y jokes. But season two onwards, it really starts to pick up. And the dramatic, um, the dramatic scenes are really, really good, you guys. Um, and... Uh, you know, Ashton Kutcher does a really great job in that show. Um, uh, Sam, shit, it's the dude with the mustache, and I'm and I'm losing his name. If you remember this guy's name, he was in uh, he was in the uh, the Big Lebowski. Sam Elliott, Sam Elliott, Sam Elliott. He's in it. Great. It's a really good show. It really kind of shows you um, 
how like what conservative ranchers have to go through and how the conservative side has to deal with corporate control of land uh kind of like what this article is talking about so okay uh let's Let's keep going down this article. Are you guys good, by the way? Is is everybody okay? Uh, I know this video is running kind of long, but I kind of knew that it would, and I'm okay with it because I haven't done a um, a video in a while, so I'm kind of having fun doing this with you guys. So I hope you guys are cool with continuing reading this thing. Um, if you gotta go, I totally get it. We're we're closing in at an hour and a half, and I really appreciate you guys fucking sticking around. <laughs> You guys are, you guys are rock stars, man. <laughs> All right. To number three, uh, marketing matters. There's little to no difference between marketing and propaganda. I literally used to teach commercial propaganda to my high school students. Yes, thank you for saying this, dude. I I have a graphic design degree, and I legitimately didn't want to join. Um, like bigger graphic design firms or or apply to anything that says like marketing manager because I was like, this is all bullshit. Like when I was like 21, I like really, really hesitated to apply for jobs because I was like, this is all, this is, marketing is taking psychology and finding out what your psychological weaknesses are and then playing up to it. That's all marketing ends up being. <laughs> They're just like, what are you scared of? We'll use that. Buy our buy our soda or your children will become communists. And it's just like, whoa, shit, I don't want my kids to be drink it, drink it. Right. Like that's that's how marketing works. <laughs> Hyperbole, I know, but that's also a marketing tool. <laughs> okay, you can say that Republicans are propaganda masters all you want. It's marketing and they're damned good at it. They are. Uh, so are the Democrats, though. Say what you want about the policies. Republicans have been uh, way the hell better at selling their policies, especially to rural America. Matthew Bates isn't wrong about why they have an advantage here. I'm not sure who Matthew Bates is. I'll have to look him up later. A win for them is to do nothing. Their whole shtick is to do absolutely nothing and to do a lot less of what you're already doing. And they've sold it incredibly well, whether it's catchy bits like Reagan's welfare queen or the line government is the problem. Republicans have been doing an excellent job of selling the idea that the government is not an instrument of the people for doing good for society. Yeah, they they've really fucking nailed that. And you know how they've nailed that? Uh, by making sure that their party is not an instrument for doing good for the people. <laughs> you have people like fucking Mitch McConnell that went against somebody in his own party, John McCain. I, I, he's kind of, I, he's not my favorite person, right? But John McCain did push back against Mitch McConnell when Mitch McConnell was making the argument that uh, corporate lobbyists and taking bribes should be legal for Congress. And John McCain was like, what the fuck are you talking about? <laughs> and Mitch McConnell was like, I think it's a good idea. It's freedom. I think if it, it's free, like, if you want to see proof that the, that the Republican Party believes that the government is not the instrument uh, of the people for doing good for society, just look at what the Republicans believe in. And, but that's dedication to the marketing. They successfully gotten a significant chunk of people to believe that the Constitution doesn't actually say in multiple places that the purpose of the government and of taxation is for the general welfare or at minimum redefined what that means to rich people going to get rich and that's the way it should be. Uh, Madison and Alexander Hamilton advocated for this shit. Alexander Hamilton several times continues to try to advocate for a fucking king. The thing that the Revolutionary War fought against, he was like, yeah, we should do that again because people are dumb. And we have a fucking musical about him that no poor person can afford to go to. Anyway, uh, they've sold a philosophy that what's good for the golden goose is good for you and the rest of you regular ganders and made people think that's morally correct. This is trickle down economics is what he's kind of describing here. Uh, they've mastered the oversimplification of complex issues for the, for the average person. 
their actual mascot really should be uh, this guy. I'm not sure who this is. I mean, it's Matthew Broderick uh, in, a, in a thing. Does anybody know who this is? Does anybody know who Matthew Broderick is performing here? If you do leave a comment, we'll come back to it. Because I don't think I've seen this movie. Uh, they're in incredibly effective at creating a problem, selling a solution, uh, which they can conveniently offer at a discount price, profiting wildly from that solution and leaving the whole thing in shambles behind them for someone else to clean up. Okay. Uh, and most of all, they're fantastic at convincing people that the alternative uh, to getting them screwed over by them is somehow worse. <laughs> oh, God. Uh, why, why do rural people eat this up? Because it seizes on something they feel pretty damn real to them. Government is constantly putting them uh, more, government is constantly putting more burdens on them and they don't feel like they're getting what they pay for. Democrats have done a bang up job of promoting mass transit and electric calls, cars and all sorts of things that they will never see. In, in the meantime, their hospitals are closing and their schools are shrinking and losing good teachers and buses. Uh, don't go past their place and the roads are falling to shit and their health insurance keeps going up. It sure seems like Democrats are helping the city people and not them. By the way, this exact problem exists in the rural communities in India as well. And I'm sure in virtually every country. Um, and Modi, another complicated figure, uh, as he, his whole thing was trying to get rural people access to healthcare, access to electricity, access to the internet. The problem is Modi is a politician and executed plans to get rid of corruption and integrate rural people into more kind of urban um, necessities in the worst possible way because he's a politician and he fell into the trap of being a politician. Um, so if you drove uh, a Tesla out to my people, they'd laugh their asses off at you. It seems like a complete impractical car to them. It's too nice uh, to get it dirty and has way too many bells and whistles. Yes, I've met these people. Uh, and that's what they see AOC telling them to buy. Uh, liberals are goddamn horrible at marketing their policies to my people. But I have to say, uh, there's there was a lot of people, including Elizabeth Warren, who came out and said that she's not trying to talk to these people. She is talking to the people that she knows is going to vote for them uh, or, or vote for her rather. And, um, you know, I think that's kind of a corporate democratic policy and it's a failing in the corporate democratic policies that they don't want to talk to the, the rural communities. Um, so I will say that, that their marketing is probably terrible because their marketing is not intended to be directed at the rural community. Um, they've kind of relegated they because they they just don't think that the rural community is even going to vote for them. So why bother? Um, and in my opinion, I think that is kind of the wrong way to go about things. If you if, if that's you know that's that's kind of my opinion on it. I think that's kind of the wrong way to go about doing things. Now this is especially true in the era of Trump. Liberals is essentially uh, have been essentially running on a platform of well we're better than that shit filled dumpster fire, right? Uh, this isn't good enough. You want progress, you have to sell it to them. Uh, these policies are undeniably good for a lot of people who haven't bought into them. Universal health care would absolutely be good for a lot of people who aren't currently voting Democrats or on board with some of the more liberal policies. Many of them are paying out of control premiums and deductibles and are going into medical bankruptcy. By the way, America is, is I think, the only country right now with medical bankruptcy. Uh, rural hospitals are going under and cutting back essential services, all of which makes it much harder on these people. A universal health insurance system uh, that could ensure that rural people can still get adequate care at a lower cost uh, than they currently pay is undeniably good for them. I constantly see liberals who just wave this away. Um, they simply refuse to market anything because they think it's obvious or only an idiot would not understand that. Again, that just plays into the pretentiousness problem. No, that's not enough. Liberals have to sell it. And yeah, they have the extra advantage that they have to play to win when all the Republicans have to do is play not to lose. Ooh, that's a good important point. 
Doing something is a lot harder than doing nothing. And it's easier to scare people into sticking with a shitty thing they know than a scary thing they don't. Uh, Republican policies right now are repacking their own warm piss <laughs> in unwashed bleach bottles with heavily with hastily craw, uh, scrawled lemonade in Sharpie with a tape. <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> Sorry, this is a ridiculous sentence. And it's kind of hilarious. Let me restart it. Republican policies right now are repacking their own warm piss in unwashed bleach bottles with hastily scrawled lemonade in Sharpie. <laughs> on a tape, taped piece uh, of ripped off notebook paper. <laughs> <laughs> Guys, that's a fucking spectacular goddamn sentence. And yeah, they have the extra advantage that they... Uh, uh, I'm sorry, I, I we'll go back to reread that point. Uh, but seriously, if you can't beat that, then you've clearly... Uh, in need a better uh, of a better marketing firm. If you want to change that, you have to sell it. No, no, stop. I can hear you complain already. <laughs> oh man, I know, I know. We, we've been reading a lot. I want to read uh, one of the comments. Ah, oh, from Jay. Okay, uh, I want to push back a little against the idea that rural people don't know that stereotypes are wrong. I feel like in this day and age, people ought to have a baseline understanding that there are some things uh, that are demeaning and unacceptable to say. If for no other reason, uh, then they wouldn't want their shit said about them. Yeah, you can't tell me that you have a problem with how your rural communities are portrayed negatively in the media and then uh, turn around and tell jokes about running Mexicans. I, I wholeheartedly agree with that, Jay. I think that is an important, um, it's, it's part of that hypocrisy. And uh, I think that hypocrisy might be sold to them. So... Th that's one thing that the minority community and the rural community probably have in common is their representation in the media. And once we find that common ground together, we can move forward to have that conversation. So I think that might be the start of the conversation uh, when you have someone in the rural community making stereotypes like running, you know, running like a Mexican with the TV set um, and, and say, hey, do you want to be portrayed as a dumb, toothless hick. And then I think start the conversation from there. You'll probably get a little bit of pushback and defensiveness, but yeah, I think I agree, man. It, it, yeah, you, you should have a baseline understanding just because you don't want the stereotypes to be levied against you anyway. That's a very good point uh, to, to bring up. That hypocrisy, I think, is, is kind of sold uh, to a lot of us in this situation. Thanks for, thanks for putting that comment up, Jay. Okay, so number four, you're bitching about conservatives not playing in good faith is a waste of time. Uh, this guy puts up some pretty good uh, pop culture quotes through here. Uh, he, he's got a Doctor Who quote up there. Uh, but I can hear the filthy liberals reading <laughs> reading this so, uh, who already just audibly sighed and got angry because they're pissed about the fact that it's a massive uphill battle. Yeah, it's a massive uphill battle. All, all progressive causes are massive uphill battles. Um, you're going to bitch about the electoral college and the gerrymandering and voter ID and all the ways that liberals are being deprived of a fair shake in government and conservatives not engaging in good faith. And there is a lot of that. There's a lot of blocks on both sides of the aisle, right? And, and the, the Green New Deal is a great example of that. When, when the first Green New Deal came out, uh, there was a lot of pushback from both the Democrats and the Republicans. Actually, going even further back, we talked about FDR earlier. The New Deal had pushback from uh, Democrats and Republicans. The Republicans, again, used their marketing machine um, and the creation of the religious right to co-opt the working class to propagandize that the New Deal was actually going to be bad for them because if corporations um, don't succeed, then they can't trickle their wealth down to their employees instead of having like protections for the employees and stuff. Uh, and two Republicans... Uh, crafted the Taft-Hartley bill, which uh, which killed the unions. Uh, so, you know what wasn't fair? Decades of getting kicked in the teeth as global trade and automation and debt traps pounded rural economies based on the agriculture and manufacturing while progressive policies promised help that never came. 
yeah, that kind of sucks. Uh, my people aren't going to play in good faith because they see no reason to, and they have no incentive to trust liberals in their playbook. Playing dirty is getting them what they want. Uh, compromising never did. Uh, and that kind of sucks that that's the, that the, that's sort of the reality of, of, of the mentality there. Uh, at least conservatives are honest about the fact that my people are on their own and can't expect meaningful assistance from the government. And to that, I say, if that's what the conservatives are saying, why are you backing up the conservatives as somebody in the rural community? As somebody that used to come from a proud working class ethic, somebody that says, if you fall on hard times, don't expect the government to help you out. You're on your own. That's your fault. You fell on hard times on your own. And conservatives still vote for politicians in the Republican Party that say that shit to them. It's, it's this very strange cognitive dissonance that I don't, I, I, I really tried to understand and I will continue to try to understand as much of that as possible because it's, it's baffling and it's, and it's kind of like tragic to me because I don't want these people to, to have to go through something like that. I don't want, I don't want them to go through a hard time and then look upon politicians and a, and a political ideology that they have trusted only for that ideology and that politician to look back at them and say, you got yourself in this mess, you get yourself out, you can go fuck yourself. That's not fucking fair at all. That's crazy. It distracts with the experience, uh, distracts with their experience. Progressives spent decades overcompromising and underdelivering. At least when they elect Republicans, they get what they pay for. If you're going to get kicked in the ass, you might as well get lower taxes out of it. Okay, that kind of answers the kind of, kind of answers the question that I had. Uh, as PJ O'Rourke once noted, the Democrats are the party that says government will make you smarter, taller, and richer and remove the crabgrass on your lawn. The Republicans are the party that says government doesn't work, uh, and then they get elected to prove it, which goes back to the earlier point that I was making. <laughs> Me and PJ O'Rourke, man. Uh, <laughs> I'm not saying uh, you need to take the low road and get in the mud at as my people say, if you wrestle with the pig in the sty, all that happens is you get dirty and the pig likes it. I'm saying you need to quit being surprised, have a plan for that, and then be better at controlling the message around it. Bernie's socialism shtick is screwing y'all over. It's the same liberal strategy that's gotten you where you are. Promise a metric to, to a shit ton that's going to be imposed on us, whether we like it or not. And then we all get to live with the catastrophic failure when it implodes. Yeah, I got to say, um, Bernie's been a little bit of a disappointment this run. Um, I was very disappointed at his performance. I, I I like what he says. And I think after all of this, uh, some of you guys know that I'm a, I was a big Tulsi supporter. And she kind of uh, shit the bed. Bernie shit the bed. Uh, and... I kind of came to the realization of something I think I was denying for a long time, which is that people like Bernie Sanders, Tulsi Gabbard, Joe Biden, Elizabeth Warren, Donald Trump, these are all mascots for an idea. Uh, and what we need to do is support the idea and, and stay true to our belief systems and support each other. Um, talk to each other about these ideas. Uh, talk to each other about, uh, you know, taking care of each other, uh, so that is sort of really, really important in this situation. I, I look at these people as mascots. I don't look at them as the be all end all of these ideas. Um, so, uh, yeah. Mark Viola. The New Deal passed with stringent support from rural communities. There's no social security without farmers and rural folk. Yes, good point, Mark. Uh, excellent point. Um, yeah, the religious right is is really what... Uh, there, there was a, a, a very uh, attractive pastor. I, I did a piece about this a couple of years ago, but this guy basically got corporations involved to kill the New Deal. Um, yeah. Uh, so... Thank you for that comment, Mark. Okay, uh, we got one more section and then we're done. Uh, thank you guys for hanging in there with me. <laughs> okay, number five. Not everything unjust is racist and not everything that's racist is intentionally racist, okay? 
Uh, words matter. What words we use matters. I tried to tell liberals this when they compared Mitt Romney to Hitler and Mussolini. I was told to go away. Uh, and here, here we are. My people won't listen to you anymore because everything is racist. Everything is over the top, or at least so they feel. And I get that criticism. I understand that criticism from both sides. There is a ton of injustice in this country, and a solid 70% of it is continued trauma and inertia from slavery and its successors. Being anything not white in this country does put you at an inherent automatic disadvantage compared to the advantage of being white. Very important thing to acknowledge. Uh, and a lot of it is trauma and inertia from slavery and the way that slavery has been transformed um, into modern labor politics. What do I mean by that? Uh, look at the way that I brought up the Taft-Hartley bill. It kills unionization. It protects corporations. Look at the way Amazon workers are treated. Look at the way Walmart employees are treated. I mean, they get pittance. Like, seven like minimum wage being seven twenty five an hour is wage theft. Like, it's the literally the bare minimum of what they can do for you to not call it slavery. Internships also are real. That's nobody's getting paid there to do work. Some of uh, some of that has to do with actual racism, and some of that has to do with disadvantages disadvantages of poverty, which largely exist because of prior actual racism. And there's a lot of catching up to do. But when everything becomes a matter of outrageous injustice, it does start to become less meaningful. When the outrage is constant, it starts to become background noise. When everything is racist, eventually nothing really is to conservatives. I have had that argument before. Um, and then it's very difficult to backpedal and say, okay, I understand that, that you're kind of listening to this cacophony, but here's the argument, and then I have to make the argument. Um, I was in Biloxi, Mississippi, a uh, great fucking great town, and there was a, a venue called Wayward Kraken, and we had a really interesting conversation after the show where they asked me if I believed Donald Trump was racist, and I said yes. Uh, I believe that he is, and I believe that he's purposely racist, because, uh, and he's purposely xenophobic because there's evidence uh, that he used the old Klan tactic to make sure that black people wouldn't live in his buildings in New York, uh, which is to when a black person would come in and they would fill out an application, they would mark the application so that they don't have to consider it. He also hires uh, undocumented workers and before the job, just before it's almost done and he has to pay them, he calls immigration on them and gets them deported. These are all intentionally racist things, right? Um, and it's, it's difficult because these are the things that we have to talk about when we talk about intentional racism, not just blan blanketly saying, well, everything Donald Trump does is racist. No, there's specific things that he does are racist. And let's talk about those specific things. And let's talk about how they've affected the communities and what we can do uh, to fight, to push back and fight back against this stuff. Um, and that's kind of, you know, what conservatives need to hear. Uh, because a lot of these conservatives don't want to be associated with the Ku Klux Klan. <laughs> uh, appropriately challenging racism and injustice is tough. It's hard to see something that is de deeply upsetting and uh, not want to just yell in rage at it. I get that. I do it a lot. It's rarely successful. I feel, uh, I feel statements are ineffective. Putting a human face uh, on an injustice is very effective. That is how what you said, uh, that is how what you just said was hurtful to me can be effective. Don't try this offline. Most of the time you're dealing with trolls who don't give a shit, but in person it can be very effective. And, and for the most part, it can be. Um, when, when I used to talk to my conservative father-in-law, that's, that's what I would point out. I would say, hey, here, here's what you're saying is, um, you know, I understand what you're saying, but here's why what you're saying is, you know, hurtful and uh, where these communities of color that you are speaking out against are coming from. Most conservatives and most of my people aren't being racist on purpose, uh, and that's why they actually get offended when you call them that. They honestly don't know why what they said or did was racist or otherwise unjust. They just have a very, very simplified view of what that means. Yeah, uh, it's not that they don't understand uh, things like microaggressions, uh, they just don't have the same context for it. 
They understand trauma, but very differently. They understand disadvantage, but very differently. Uh, take a calm, calming breath and respond in kindness. Explain to them what was said is hurtful and why most of my people are not intentionally hurtful. They are try they, they're not trying to be racist. They're, they literally don't understand why they said uh, what they said was hurtful. And that's one of the comments that Jay brought up, right? Um, is this sort of ignorance and blindness uh, to it. And they don't understand how making a joke about a Mexican stealing a TV and rural people being called hicks and them not liking it is the same. They can't see that. <laughs> so sometimes it's like, okay, here's why. And, and if you explain it, I think you'll probably end up getting um, a halfway decent response. Uh, people do switch sides if they have a good reason. So writing off my people as a lost cause. Uh, so quit writing off my people as a lost cause. Honestly, this one bothers me the most. I can't tell you how many liberals who are thoroughly convinced that every Trump supporter and every Republican is a lost cause and will never, ever change. Uh, one of your own standard bearers changing sides, Elizabeth Warren. She was a Republican and a diehard conservative not that long ago. She was 47 when she switched sides after she spent a long time dealing with bankruptcies and foreclosures as a lawyer and then uh, through having her grad assistants research that. She was convinced uh, of the Republican line before then that people failed the consumer game because they were bad at it and made bad choices <clears throat> and scammed the system. She found that people in bankruptcy were often a lot different than the irresponsible deadbeats she'd believed them to be. She eventually saw how corporate America had been trapping people into debt cycles for a long time, and that's how we got Liz Warren we see today. Which is also very confusing why she made a public statement that she wasn't going to talk to conservatives. Um, you know, it, it doesn't... Uh, um, it didn't make sense to me when she said that. I don't, I don't know if she was just trying to play up to the to the base or or, or what it was, but it, it it she comes from that background, so she kind of knows. If there was anybody in the race that should have been able to talk to the rural community, talk to Republican voters, and get them to understand progressive policy, it should have been Liz Warren. And I was very surprised and disappointed to hear that from her. Um, there are a lot of Obama Trump voters who voted for hope and change and then turned around and voted for Trump. Okay. Uh, and perhaps this shouldn't be entirely surprising. There were a lot of people, especially the rural voters from where I'm from, who voted for Obama, though they thought they were going, uh, who voted for Obama thought they were going to get hope and change and they got shit on with the recovery from the 2008 financial collapse. They didn't get the bailouts or the assistance. They didn't get their jobs back. They didn't see most of the recovery. Their industries, their towns all remained in Lewis, ruins. Uh, God bless David Wong over at Crack who fucking nailed it with this PC links a piece to the, to the thing. Uh, and it was written before Trump was elected. So that should tell you that it wasn't some liberal soul searching afterwards. It was a warning. Farm bankruptcies were already rising under Obama at small dairy, uh, small dairies and crop farmers went under more and more due in large part to predatory debt traps and then a freeze on credit. The CFPB helped a little, which is why you're seeing these skyrocket under Trump's the massive deregulatory push. And now this is going to happen again, by the way. They're doing this again. They're waiting for people to be in these rent debts, these mortgage debts. Uh, the agricultural industry is, uh, is 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 dumping their food. I mean, like they're they they could just give it as a donation and get a tax write off or something. There has to be a way to to donate their their food to to food pantries and shelters uh, in in these various areas, uh, but they're not. And these farms are 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 going to end up with um, mortgage back payments of three months, which is no different than what they do when you can't pay. Your, your your mortgages or anything like that. And uh, and they're going to get screwed at the end of it. 100%. This is going to happen. Um, and we're, I mean, we're, we're seeing the beginnings of this. So, you know, 
push back against that. Push back against the narrative that we don't need a a total freeze um, on rents and mortgages right now. And support the the strikes that are happening to, to get that through. Because if not, then we'll see the same thing that happened in 2008. But my people felt betrayed by eight years of Obama. They saw their health insurance get more and more expensive. And all the growth in the stock market sure didn't seem to help them. So when Hillary ran effectively as Obama's third term, they were willing uh, to throw their lot in with Trump, who they believed knew the secret sauce to being rich was going to somehow share it with everybody. They really thought that he was going to somehow strong arm China into uh, playing better and everything else. Many of them still do. They think they're going to get the uh, change that they were promised under Obama. And believe me, plenty of them feel just as betrayed and ready to burn the whole thing to the ground because they feel uh, just as betrayed by both sides. Some of them are sticking with Trump, even though uh, they know he's burning everything to the ground, because at least then they'll have the government off their backs. If everything's going to shit either way, might as well go for the one who is uh, going to get rid of all of those pesky regulations about why they can't drain off the backs, uh, back willows and get a few extra acres. My people are not ideologues for the most part. They don't actually care about small government conservatism or the nanny state. Uh, those are just convenient things they're repeating as stand-ins for what they really want. They really want the basics of a fair shake in life, reasonable rules that make sense, and general security. They want the Res Roosevelt Square deal. They want to be. Uh, they want to quit being punished for working hard when it does feel like some others are gaming the system. Corporations mostly. Uh, they want a path to retirement. They want to be able to try their hand at business. They want to be able to send their kids to a good school. Uh, they want to live in a safe neighborhood. They want to drive on decent roads. They want a hospital that isn't hundreds of miles away and that won't bankrupt them. All of these things, by the way, sh you should not be punished for wanting these things. And right now we have a system that does punish you for wanting these things, or it, it, it holds you hostage. Like your health insurance should not be tied to your work. So if you're a small business owner, or if you're uh, if you're a small rural farmer, and you should not be paying astronomical fees to get health insurance. Um, you should not have to take out crazy fucking loans to send your kids to college. That should not be things that should happen. You should not have to have your retirement tied into into the the fucking stock exchange with a four hundred one k. That's all. That's all ridiculous. It's all how the oligarchy basically controls every aspect of our life, which goes back to how slavery has been transformed. Anyway, um, they want laws and regulations that are logical and not overburdensome, and most of all, something they have uh, uh, some say over. They want to put food on the table. They want basic dignity and respect. They want progressives to want, uh, they want what progressives want to give them and they'll gladly pay their taxes if they think they're actually going to sell them, uh, if they're actually going to get it. Sell them on how your policies will give them that. And seriously, you can make progressives out of lifelong Republicans. That was a good read. That was a good read. Um, hey, Jack, I dig the Biden look. Uh, oh, with my sunglasses? I got to wear it so that I don't blow out my friggin' eyes, Mark. Uh, Mark Viola, by the way, is uh, is the person that sent me this article. Uh, and uh, uh, I appreciate that. And I encourage you guys to do the same thing. Um, you should you should send me articles that uh, I... Uh, I should I should look into and I probably will. Uh, so yeah, I I I appreciate Mark for sending me this article. But it was a very good it was a very um, well written article. A lot of good thoughts, a lot of good arguments that were made in there. I hope you guys got something out of that. Uh, it 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 kind of validated some stuff, a lot of stuff that I've been saying for the last few years um, in terms of like, okay, we got to really start listening to each other here. This response. Uh, to Trump, who is sort of the the symptom in the face and the mascot of corporatism and uh, pop and, and right wing populism uh, and this strongman complex and this American exceptionalism that's been failing America's for a long America for a long time. 
uh, why did this happen? Why did people think that this was the right solution? Let's talk to people. And I got shit on a lot for saying that. Um, and, uh, and you know, I, I feel like that might be the path forward in talking to Republicans, because when I've talked to Republicans that have come out to see my shows, when I've talked to conservatives who have come out to see my shows, um, they kind of look at me and kind of do the same thing, right? They're just kind of like, yeah, I never thought about it that way. And that's kind of a cool thing to hear in all honesty is, um, that that they were like, yeah, I didn't. I never really thought about it that way. You you changed the way that I looked at something, and then when I sit down and talk to them, I go, oh, I never thought about it the way you're presenting it. That's really cool, man. Like you made me think a little bit differently about certain issues, um, you know. And I got I got to say, like Jay Jackson does this a lot. Whenever we talk, is we'll have we'll have these similarities, and then Jay will just take a a you know. 10 degrees over to the left and I'll go, oh, I never really thought about it that way. That's a good point. Thank you for bringing that up and adding that to my perspective because I don't think I would have had that perspective had you not brought it up. And I think these conversations are very important to have um, rather than yelling and screaming at each other. Um, I, I believe in talking about ideas. That's sort of the thing that I think I'm, I'm trying to move forward with. So uh, let's talk about these ideas. Let's talk about why they work, why they don't, why why you feel abandoned by them, and what's what's going on with you. Uh, I think that's let let's add some let's add some humanity to to the policies and the thoughts and ideas that we believe in. What's going on, everybody? If you enjoyed this video, there is more stuff like this coming on this channel. So make sure you hit that subscribe button hit that bell icon to make sure you're getting updates about my videos. Make sure you hit that like button because uh, I think there's a dislike campaign happening on the channel. There's like one person that's just disliking all my shit. That's weird. Uh, but uh, make sure you hit the like button. Make sure you hit the share button. Get the word out about this channel. Uh, and there are going to be more videos like this. But if you enjoy this video and you want to be a part of the live comedy experience in this virtual world that we're living in now uh, where, uh, where all the performance art is going virtual uh, for the time being you can join my zoom live stand-up comedy shows it's called the citizen revolution comedy show uh, the first one is on may 8th uh, and they will be consecutively every other week all of the dates are available on my website right now ramen noodles comedy.com that's r-a-m-a-n noodles comedy.com Go grab your tickets right now. They're only five bucks. Five bucks gets you in, um, and it's five bucks per residence, not five bucks per person. Uh, it's just to grab you a spot. Uh, so go to my website, ramennoodlescomedy.com. That's R-A-M-A-N, noodlescomedy.com. Grab your ticket. Come hang out with me. Uh, if you can, you can become a sustaining member over on the website. Sustaining members get free tickets uh, to come see the Zoom virtual Citizen Revolution comedy show. Um, or you can make a one-time donation as well. Uh, but all of this stuff helps keep me afloat, uh, keeps me uh, being able to put food on the table uh, and cover all of my bills and expenses uh, to make sure that I'm putting out regular content. Thank you for tuning in. Thank you for subscribing. Hope to see you again. Stay safe.